welcome. My name is Ann Komen. It is so great to have you all join us this morning, and I hope you're ready to learn the best way to plant a tree. Um, I want to ask you to uh, please remember to mute your microphones. Altadena Heritage is pleased to present this third and last tree workshop of the year. It's, a, it's the last in a series of three. If you missed either of the first two, you can watch them on the Altadena Heritage website. Last Saturday, we provided new homes to about 20 trees. And this afternoon, we'll be giving away another 20 trees, uh, which we're really thrilled about, finding new homes for 40 trees in our community. Our workshops and tree giveaway are a large part of our program to combat the urban heat island effect in Altadena. This program is made possible by generous grants from Southern California Edison. If you think our work is worthwhile, please consider joining Altadena Heritage. Today's presentation includes a video which was shot by Michelle Zach, for which we thank her. And now I will introduce Dr. Gerald Turney. Dr. Turney received his BS, his Bachelor's of Science degree in Botany from California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, and his PhD in Plant Pathology from the University of California in Riverside. Dr. Turney has worked at the Huntington Botanical Gardens as curator of the Camellia Gardens and at the Arboretum of Los Angeles County as a research horticulturalist. He joined the Department of Agricultural Commissioner for Los Angeles County in 2000 as a senior biologist plant pathologist and retired from that position in January of this year. In addition to his academic career, Dr. Turney was formerly a licensed landscape contractor and is currently a licensed agricultural pest control advisor and an ISA certified arborist. His primary fields of expertise are plant pathology, mycology, and arboriculture. So uh, take it away, Dr. Turney. Good morning. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, today's presentation will be a little shorter than the last two. Uh, you know, it doesn't take that long to talk about how to plant a tree correctly. So we have this short video. Of course, you've already gone through the the previous seminar or meeting where we talked about selecting the right spot for your tree. Now let's talk about you know, how to dig that hole, how deep to dig it, uh, and how to stake the tree after you've planted it. And then a couple little things about pruning newly planted trees. Uh, you don't prune them a lot, just a little bit. Uh, you can do a lot of good work with a little pair of hand shears that if you don't do it and come back in 10 or 20 years, you you either can't fix it at all, or you're, you're cutting off huge pieces of the tree with a chainsaw. So let's go to our video. Um, and here it is. Let this start up. You're playing it? Or? Doesn't so seem to want to play for me here. Just a moment. There we go. So, um, just go back a hair. So, I came up last week, uh, I guess it was last week, to plant this um, Australian willow, which is not a true willow. It's, um, So I'm going to mute that and talk over the video. So now we're digging the hole. The hole should be no deeper than the root ball. So the root ball is, you know, right in here, about this height. The danger of digging a hole too deep and then setting the root, the tree in the hole is then the uh, top of the root ball will be below grade. And you want that top of the root ball to be either at grade or about an inch above grade when you're finished planting the tree. If you dig it too deep, now here I'm just using the shovel to kind of estimate the height of the root ball. So I can stick my shovel in the hole and it was just about the right uh, depth. So that's as deep as I want it. Uh, here I'm also going to check it again with a, a tape to make sure that 
Um, and you can also set your shovel across the hole and measure it right to the shovel. Then go over and measure that root ball on the pot. It's just below the lip. And so this was already deep enough. And, you, know, you don't have to go real deep. Uh, if you again, if you dig it too deep and then you throw dirt back in to raise the root ball, that soil you threw back in will settle and the root ball will sink. Um, so now you want to expand the uh, diameter of your root of your uh, hole. And what I'm just demonstrating here, I'm going to stop the video just for a second. If you dig and you're shoving your, uh, pushing your shovel into the soil, like all the way around, you, when you dig the hole, it shears the soil and leaves a very shiny or, or hard or flat surface when you're digging the hole. That often is, becomes impenetrable, impenetrable to roots. So to get the roots to grow out into the soil, what I do is I place the shovel this way and and so I have a rough surface on the edges of the hole. So you can see, uh, let's just watch it. You see, and then I'm breaking, it kind of knocks the soil loose. You see how I'm, I'm, I'm not pointing, I'm not facing the hole, I'm facing the edge of the hole. And I, I dig it like this. So now this edge that I'm creating when I dig the hole is not sheared and smooth, it's rough. Um, now this soil could have been a little moist, a little more moisture in the soil would have made it a little easier. Normally it's not a good idea to jump on your shovel like this <laughs> because you can tumble over, but the soil was a little firm, so it needed a little more force to do it. So yes, the day or two before you plant your tree, put out a little sprinkler, a little coffee cup, and run the sprinkler until there's a week, two or three inches in the cup that may take an hour or two. Then you're gonna give it about two days to drain and dry. Uh, you don't wanna work a wet soil. Never dig your hole in a soaking wet soil. You give it a couple days to drain and dry. This is okay. It's just a little more work if it's, if it's on the dry side. This had been pre-watered. Um, and so there is moisture in the soil. So you can see I'm, I'm working my way around. Now we're checking the, the diameter of the hole. It should be about two and a half times the size of the root ball itself. And you can make it three or four times the size, that's fine. Don't, the idea here is we're gonna break up the soil all around here so it's loose. And, and the, uh, the, root, the tree will now easily grow out into the soil around it. So everything is about getting early establishment. Now there were some circled roots at the bottom of this. Uh, not too bad. So I pulled a few loose. Just you don't want to leave those roots that are circling around. You can either cut them off, or if they pull apart a little bit easily. So here I am pulling them off the base of the. You often get these circling roots right at the bottom of the of the pot. Loosen those up. Try and spread them out in the hole a little bit. Another thing I want to say is before you plant your tree, make sure it's well watered. Uh, this root ball was a little on the dry side. Uh, it's okay. Um, but if you've got a, a, a five gallon or a 15 gallon and, and it's dry, it may be harder to get it out of a pot. So you always get it good and wet. Maybe the day before you're going to plant it. Again, let it drain and dry a little bit. And it'll come out of the pot easier. And the tree will be well hydrated uh, when you plant it, which is always good. So now we're taking a look at how we, we want to orient the tree in either north, south, kind of, or east and west orientation. This tree is pretty symmetrical already, so it's not really critical. It has a lot of side branches on it, which is really good because these slower branches here on the side are going to feed the trunk and produce a lot of food. You don't want to just strip all these off when you plant the tree. You're just going to come and, and cut the tips off to dwarf them so that in a year you can come and remove them entirely. If you don't remove these br lower branches uh, and leave them and come, then you're going to end up with a very low branch tree that's going to take up more space. Most people want to walk under their trees uh, or at least be able, you know, typically you want your uh, first scaffolds to be at about 10 to 12 feet. But if you got a very large estate, or, you know, an acre, half acre, whatever, then you could go ahead and leave these lower branches on. 
um, it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So now I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm filling in with a little backfill. If you want, you can mix some compost or mulch. Now what we're mixing in here is a combination of fertilizer and mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae are, are beneficial fungi that infect roots, grow out into the soil, absorb nutrients. Uh, it, this is probably a, a good idea. It's not absolutely required, but this is gonna help get you early establishment. Here I'm gonna mix what, you know, the product into the soil. This is only about 2% nitrogen, <coughs> which is a very weak fertilizer. You only want to use a little, you know, a little bit of nitrogen just to give it a boost, just to get some good growth and establishment. Don't be using something that's like 15% or 30% nitrogen, like a lawn fertilizer. Get a, a low nitrogen fertilizer. You can use, there's all sorts of them available on the market. And these mycorrhizae fertilizer mixes are a good idea too. We're going to put a little more on the surface when we're done. Here I am. You know, if you wanted, you could have, like I said before, you can mix the mulch into here. One of the problems with putting too much organic matter in the hole is if you create this perfect environment for the roots, sometimes they don't grow out into the native soil, the natural soil, all that uh, readily. Um, what's even better for the tree or, or actually very highly recommended is when you're done, you put about two to four inches of compost on the surface, leaving about a three to six inch circle around the trunk where there's no mold. So we're filling it in here. And of course I wear a hat because I don't want the sun on my face, uh, gloves, so I you know, don't end up with blisters. It's all good stuff. And this you know, usually takes a half hour to an hour to plant a tree. Let's let, let this run. We're just filling in here making sure I'm breaking up any large dirt clods. You know, I want, you know, the goal, remember your goal is, is get this tree established as quickly as possible. Now, after you've planted the tree, we're going to build a berm around it with the soil to create a bowl. And then we're gonna fill that bowl up uh, three times. And I wanna really get this soaked. You wanna really water it the first day you plant it. And then approximately, once a week thereafter for the first year. Now, this is the best time of year to plant. November, uh, December are great months to plant. It'll give you about nine months in the ground before we get the heat of summer next July, August, September. And hopefully you'll get some good root growth in here over the next nine months. Not so much in the winter, but mostly in the spring. This tree, now we're gonna remove this nursery stake here in a moment. Here we're watering immediately. Get it, you know, so we've built this little berm around here. These berms tend to, to kind of wash away, especially if we get good rain or just over time, this berm will break down and get lower. So I'm always kind of redoing my berms in my backyard on my fruit trees. So like, and as the tree grows, you can actually make this berm a little larger. And then after a year or two, you can, you know, you don't necessarily need the, the bowl and the burn. You can use a little sprinkler. This, you know, these Australian willows are phenomenally drought tolerant, equivalent probably as drought tolerant as a uh, olive. So once established, they actually can be watered about every other month in the spring and the fall and once a month in the summer. Um, but if you want a little better growth, probably once a month in the spring and the fall and every two weeks in the summer. So I'm removing all, all the, uh, the plant tape that ties this uh, nursery stake on, you've got to remove this nursery stake when you plant the tree. If you leave it, this plant tape will actually constrict the growth of the trunk right where it's tied. You come back in a few years and it'll, it'll, it'll come down, it'll get narrower and then get larger. You've actually can, you know, restrained the growth of the trunk right where that plant tape was. And those end up being permanent uh, weaknesses in the trunk and high winds can sometimes break it off right at that point. And I've seen that happen. So here we are removing the, this and then sometimes it's just break off because the bottom of the stake is rotted. This one just pulled out quite easily. Um, now we've got two, uh, I believe these are three inch uh, stakes. You can get them at Home Depot, Lowe's, almost any garden center will carry them. 
You're going to put them on opposite sides of the tree. This is a post driver, and this is really handy. Uh, without it, you're going to need a ladder and a hammer or something hard. So you pound these into the ground real good, maybe a little more here. You want to get those in so they're real steady and really down into the ground. If they're too shallow, they're not going to really work well. We'll get the other one in here now. So they're on opposite sides of the tree. Uh, I don't put them in the root ball. I put them outside the root ball. I don't want to damage roots. So pound this down in. Now you're going to want to use a flexible uh, material in a figure eight that goes around the tree. We're, this is a little unconventional. We're going to use these bungee cords, actually. Uh, that's what we had available. Um, you can buy various products at all the garden centers for tying trees to stakes. A lot of people like to use old garden hose, cut a, a pretty good length of it. You can nail it in here, wrap it around the trunk once, and nail it to the other one. You don't need a real low one, although you, I often see that done. When you're done, you want the you don't want this real tight. This is a, a little bit snug, but as long as the tree will move in the wind, then and not a lot, just a little bit of movement in the wind, that actually encourages strengthening of the trunk. It, you know, if you tie it up too tight, like to that nursery stake and leave it. You can take the nursery stake off a year later and the tree still flops over. The other thing I want to point out is this particular tree was holding itself up quite nicely without any staking. And, and in a strict sense, if a tree will hold itself up without staking, you don't need to stake the tree. Now, this is a high wind area. Altadena gets a lot of high winds. So it's not about, you know, this first year, not a bad idea to go ahead and stake it, even though it's holding itself up. We're going to add a little plant tape uh, to stabilize the top of the tree, too, to try and get it to grow a little straighter. Now, this particular tree has a real pendant growth habit. So it grows up like this, and it goes up, and then the top goes over. Then it grows and it goes over. Then it grows up and it grows over. That's its growth habit. So we don't necessarily need to force this to be absolutely straight, but just to encourage that central leader. And what's nice here, is that there's only one central leader. We don't have to try and um, pick central leaders. If your tree has been cut off in the nursery and there's two or three shoots at the top of the tree, you need to pick one that's going to be your central leader. And uh, let's go ahead and stop that. And I'll stop that. So you're going to want to pick that central leader and then nip the, uh, the tips off the uh, other two or however many are other uh, co-dominant leaders there are. Just pinch them. You can just pinch them and take out about a quarter inch or a half inch, or you can use hand shears just to nip them. Then that one that you leave, and I typically pick the tallest one or the straightest one, and then uh, nip the other two or one. Sometimes there's just two co-dominant leaders. Sometimes there'll be three or four. The, when you nip the other two or three, that one you leave will take off and quickly outgrow the others. And then you come back in about a year and you remove them entirely. Now, if you think back to that tree, maybe I turned off the video a little quick. It had all those side branches all over the trunk. And really, that tree is only about five feet tall. So it, uh, all those branches you see on that tree, when that tree's mature, they won't be there. So in order to limit the size of the wounding when you remove those branches, you just take off the tips of all those little branches all over the trunk. Those branches will shade the trunk from full sun. That's really important. Uh, full sun on the south and west sides of trunks in July, August, September will burn the bark. Uh, some trees are very sensitive to full sun on their barks, like avocados, uh, but really any tree is. I've seen people incorrectly plant expensive, uh, large box trees. And uh, you, when I got there, three to four feet of the western side of the trunk, a tree trunk was killed and the bark sloughing. And 
Now you've got a big open wound. It's just a disaster. You can't fix it. So protect your trees from the full sun on the west and south sides by leaving those side branches on and just tip them. Now, you come back in about a year, year and a half, and that tree hopefully has put on some new growth and it's, it's got enough new growth in the shoots above to start shading the trunk. That's when you can remove the side branches. And by dwarfing them, by tipping them and dwarfing them, when you remove them entirely, you leave a smaller wound. You don't want to come back and removing two inch trunks or two inch uh, side branches when you could be removing half inch side branches. So whenever you're pruning trees, you always try and accomplish your goals with the smallest pruning cuts possible, generally two inches or less when you're you know, pruning large mature trees. Um, then now you're gonna water the tree once a week uh, for the first year and a half or so. Um, and uh, let's see, what else do we want to cover on that? Um, and generally, you only stake a tree for one year. Now, maybe one to two years. Uh, if you pull off, if in a year you take off the stakes and the tree flops over, well, you've, you've uh, removed it a little too early. Um, but as soon as the tree holds itself up uh, and it's getting established, then you don't need those stakes anymore. Uh, but the way that's staked is even if you leave it on a little too long, it's not going to damage the trunk. What, what, the way you damage the trunk is leaving the nursery stake on. It's right up against the side when the wind blows and it rubs, it'll break the, the actual trunk. The plant tape will, will actually damage the trunk too. I've seen many trees over the years where you've got a piece of hose sticking out of the middle of the trunk that was used as a trunk tie for the staking. Uh, and it was never removed and the trunk got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now it's 20 years later and those trunk ties are inside the trunk. <laughs> and uh, not a, that's a weakness now that in a high wind, that's a point that could snap and break. Um, so uh, kind of quick there on, on planting. Again, as big a circle as you can, as you can dig uh, down. Uh, you can actually, when you get farther out, you can dig down deeper if you want. But where that uh, root ball is going to rest should not be any deeper than the root ball itself. Uh, and then it's not a bad idea to add a little bit of organic matter to the backfill. But there was some research done years ago on the best way to plant fruit trees. And uh, they found the best way to plant fruit trees was to take a backhoe, scoop up a big scoop of dirt, dump it back in the hole, and then just put the tree right in there with no added amendments. They got their fastest establishment that way. Um, but it always is good to especially mulch the surface of the soil after you've planted the tree. And actually for the life of the tree, it's always good to mulch the tree. So every spring and every fall, you can add a thick layer of compost, two to four inches thick. You can get bag compost. You can use your own compost from your own compost bin if you compost at home. Um, I get the cheapest material I can get at one of the big box stores, Home Depot, Lowe's, it doesn't matter where you go. They run around $2.50 a bag, $3 a bag. I'm not going to buy something expensive just to put on the surface. Um, and now there's a number of different ways uh, products you can buy that are uh, fertilizer, mycorrhizae mixtures. Dr. Earth is one of them, but there are many now on the market. And you'll see on their labels, it'll say with mycorrhizae. You can flip it on the back side and you'll they'll list all the different species of fungi they have in the mixture. And just a brief, uh, if you're not familiar with the term mycorrhizae, myco means fungus, rhizae means root. So the term means fungus root. There are two kinds, or broadly speaking, there are two kinds of mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae that in effect the inside the root, which are called endomycorrhizae, and those that grow on the outside of the root, which are called ectomycorrhizae. These mixtures in these products are both. So the idea is you can take the, the product and put it on any tree. Most trees are endomycorrhizal. About 10% of the trees on earth are ectomycorrhizal. So all your pines, all your, you know, the phagaceae, which is oak and beet, uh, eucalyptus, those are all ectomycorrhizal. And those fungi tend to be mushroom forming fungi. And then the endomycorrhizae, that's a lot like almost everything else, all your fruit trees, the whole, you know, virtually everything you can think of. 
and they don't produce large fleshy bodied uh, reproductive structures. They produce microscopic reproductive structures in the soil, spores. They produce spores in the soil uh, exterior to the root. And actually the lab I came out of out of UCR was one of the major mycorrhizal research labs. Dr. John Mingy must have published over a hundred papers on mycorrhizae. And it's an interesting subject. Now, here's the reality. Mycorrhizae are ubiquitous and they're in the soil. They're not gone unless you got rid of them somehow. And the way you get rid of them is to fumigate the soil with a fumigant like methyl bromide, which is no longer available on the market. Um, but there's other fumigants available now. Or if you grade it off the top two to three, two to three feet of the soil to make a pad to build a home, you've removed the mycorrhizae. So that's when it's really important to remove to add them. But I've seen a lot of good uh, growth response from these products, especially on trees in decline. It's not a particularly expensive product, so adding it into the hole is a is a good idea. So um, now I guess we could, unless Anne has something to add, maybe if anyone has any questions. Yes, yeah, let's take questions. We could take two questions. You can either type them into the chat box, click on chat at the bottom of the screen and then type your question in. Or you could click on participants at the bottom of the screen and um, raise your hand. There's a button where you could raise your hand where you can um, ask your question without typing it in. So let's uh, let's see what's come into the chat, chat box. Can you spell those names? Uh, what names were we talking about now? Uh, oh, Selena, can you? Can you, um, Selena, can you unmute yourself and, and ask your question? And which names are you talking about? Well, she, typed it, about she typed the question when you were talking about the Michael Risey. Oh, okay. The, my, so spell Michael Risey. Michael Risey, M-Y-C-O-R-R-H-I-Z. A E, Micor Risey. And Ecto and Indo just goes in the front of them. Uh, and, you know, if you're interested in maybe just reading a little bit about it, of course, you'd go to Wikipedia. There'll be a big page on it there. Uh, there's a lot of websites, especially from these uh, people who manufacture the product, touting the benefits of mycorrhizae. Healthy, vigorous trees that are established in your garden, probably you won't see a good, you know, a big growth promotion by applying these to healthy, vigorous trees already. Of course, fertilizing trees almost always results in growth promotion, especially you know, nitrogen primarily responsible for that. <clears throat> so if you have a tree that you don't think you're getting the proper growth, um, you can either use one of these products. Now on an established tree, the way you apply mycorrhizae is you drill holes in the soil with a one or two inch auger and a drill about eight to 10 inches deep and every one to two feet all around the tree. Uh, often what I do, or I've done in the past for trees that are in decline and doing badly, uh, you know, say you got a large, you know, 40 to 50 foot tree that's thinning, it's got, you know, a poor growth in the spring and you know there's something wrong with it. There's not a lot you can do to really get trees to recover other than change how you're taking care of them. Uh, usually if they've got a specific disease, there's not a lot of, of treatment options. So you take the mycorrhizae, I get 50 pound bags, uh, and I might as well just, you know, from Jay Mitchell, Landscape Supply in San Gabriel. And about a 50 pound bag from them will treat a, a one large 50 foot tree. And so you drill holes every one to two feet all around the canopy, underneath the canopy of the tree, anywhere from 50 to 100 holes. You pour the material in, it looks like coffee grounds. It's very similar, you know, small granular material. <clears throat> and then you water it in real good. And if you do that in the spring, February, March, you'll typically see a pretty strong growth response, usually within about three months. Uh, and hopefully you'll see, continue to see good growth responses the following spring. So, <laughs> so Jerry, there's another question. Um, how can one avoid air pockets when planting trees? Well, you take your hose and turn it on and just keep shoving it in there and stirring it with your shovel. Uh, and that'll settle the soil. And as it settles, you'll probably have to add more soil. You can get some air pockets, but if you water it real good, it should all settle down. 
<coughs> you can stir it a little bit with your shovel. Uh, Jerry, could I or ask you to repeat the watering? So you filled the watering basin three times when the tree was planted. And yeah. do you recommend that every week uh, that we water every week and also fill the basin three times when we're watering? Is that right? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. If we're talking. But so, yeah, um, fill that basin three times. You know what I do for my fruit trees that are established? And now I'm only watering them once a month, spring and fall, two, every two weeks in the summer. As I set my hose in the basin, I fill up the basin, and then I turn the hose to a trickle. And I'll come back in 30 minutes, and I fill it up again. And then I set it to a trickle. Then I fill it up a third time. And by experience, I know that that's going to give me about a two-foot soak. <coughs> Sorry, I should have some water here. I, I think Stefan had a, uh, a question. So Stefan, uh, where is that? I see one when planting grafted trees, what is the correct position of the graft? Well, the graft is, is, is radial. Uh, when you're planting your tree, I think most of your trees, there won't be a lot of uh, issues about how you rotate it. Sometimes with the larger trees, especially a box tree, you may want to orient certain you know, branches that have already developed that you're going to retain in a certain direction, east, west. You don't want it going towards your house or toward something else. But, um, you know, like that, that Agonis, the, uh, the Australian willow, we could have pretty much planted it in any radial uh, rotation. But then the, the graft union is going to be a circle. You know, and I'm not sure that, you know, some of your trees may be grafted and others may have been grown directly from cuttings and there won't be a graft union at all. Uh, grafted trees, uh, you know, a lot of them, almost all your magnolias will be grafted trees because they're named varieties. Any named variety will be grafted. Uh, but things like, you know, just species like Quercus agrifolia, that's grown from seed. That's not going to have a graft union. Uh, you know, that Adonis didn't have a graft union. It was probably grown either from seed or it was grown from a cutting. Many of our trees are grown from cuttings. That's kind of the, the fastest and cheapest way. So don't worry about that, the graft union, unless you've got, a, you know, if you're talking about a triple or a grafted fruit tree, uh, you want to uh, orient the fastest growing variety to the north and the slower variety, growing varieties to the south or west. If, for instance, you have a citrus with lemon, uh, lime and, and an orange, the lemon should be on the north side. That's their vigorous growers. So you always orient the fastest growing variety to the north. Jerry, should the graft union be buried or should it be above oh, no. the soil? No, you know, that would bury the whole, no, no, normally the graft unions are two or three inches above the root ball. So oh. that would, you know, never bury your root ball. You don't want your root ball to cover up. You don't want that natural soil to cover up the root ball. So how does water move in the soil? This is kind of an important point. Water fills the soil. Think of the soil as a, as a sponge with, with large, what we call macro pores and smaller micro pores. So water is held in the soil uh, in the micro pores and drains rapidly from macro pores. So a sand, a pure sand would be all macro pores. And you pour water on it and it flashes through and it retains very little water. Uh, uh, so at a clay, a heavy clay, you would water it, but it's almost all micro pores. And it, once it gets wet, it won't drain. Now a loam is a soil with equal influence of sand, silt, and clay. So these are what we call soil texture classes. So you often hear what a loam, and you think, oh, it sounds good. Well, what is it really? A loam is a soil with equal influence from silt, sand, and clay. And clay has a disproportionate influence on the soil. So a loam will only have about 20% clay, maybe 30% clay, but that would probably be a clay loam. There's a little a soil uh, texture class triangle with sand, silt, and clay. So once you fill the soil, after you've watered the soil and it's holding all the water it can hold, that's called field capacity. Now the soil is going to drain and dry, you know, drain out of the soil, 
the tree is going to take up some water. So water will evaporate from the surface. And over about a two week period, that soil is going to drain and dry. The macropores drain first, the micropores hold the water the longest. Um, and now, I've, so understanding that when you, when you soak that soil, um, well, I'm trying to think of what my point was. What was the question again? <laughs> Uh, I, I think we were talking about graft unions and we were talking about watering and oh, filling the basin okay, I'm three glad, times. Okay, now I'm remembering. Okay, so if you cover the root ball with a uh, thick, uh, like an inch of the native soil, the water will tend to penetrate that soil and then wick around and the root ball won't get wet. So when you have a basin and you fill it up, you're making sure you get the root ball wet and don't cover that root ball with the native soil. But Stephen Zeter had a question. Uh, yeah, maybe unmute him so he can ask his question. Yes. Go ahead, Stephen. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Stephen Zeter. You're muted. Uh, there you go, Stephen. There you go. Uh, when you tip the, uh, the lower branches, how much you cut off? Oh, maybe a, a half an inch to an inch. Uh, really, you're just taking out the growing point. Okay. Not much, just a, a little bit, you know, um, because eventually you're just going to remove that branch entirely. And your goal is just to, to prevent it from growing a lot faster and to keep it from getting a larger diameter. So you come back in a year and you take off a small diameter branch rather than a large diameter. But roughly a half an inch to an inch is, is adequate. Okay, then uh, I already got my tree in the ground and I watered it. I filled the bowl last night. Uh, you say I should fill it three times as soon, when I plant it? Well, that's what I do just to make sure I get a real good soak on the day I plant it. Actually, I use that three, you know, I fill the bowl three times every time I water my tree. I want a good deep soak. You know, you don't have to use the basin. You can use a soaker hose. You can use a hose with a little sprinkler on the end. But I, I, I like basin. So, okay. Now, a lot of now, as your tree gets mature and gets larger and larger and larger, that basin will be too small because the roots will be getting out into the soil. So, so you're looking at a 10-year tree, a 15-year tree. At that point, you probably, I would probably be using, especially if you're looking at large shade trees. My fruit trees don't get that big. I keep them to 12 feet. Uh, so you got a big, you know, 20, 30-foot tree, and now the roots are out maybe even five feet beyond the drip line or the edge of the canopy. I use a hose with a hose in sprinkler. I turn it on real low just to water underneath the canopy of the tree. I put out a coffee cup. And when I've got three inches of water in the coffee cup, I've run it long enough. That may take an hour, two hours, three hours. It depends on how much you turn on the hose, what, how much your flow is uh, on, that, on your faucet. You know, the way we measure water application to a landscape is inches per hour. But when you're talking about your hose or the sprinkler system, we talk about gallons per minute. Uh, and you can convert that, but you need how many your actual space that you're applying the water to. <coughs> Typically, well, if you got a good flow, you'll be flowing around 10 gallons per minute. If you only got five gallons per minute, you don't have, you know, that's real low flow rate. Uh, and when you design your, if you have a sprinkler system in your garden, you add up all the gallons per minute of all the sprinkler heads and it can't exceed the flow rate from your water source. So if you add up all your sprinkler heads and it says 12 gallons, because it's right on the top of the sprinkler head, it says, you know, 0.75 gallon, you know, like a quarter head would be 0.75. You know, it, it's varies by manufacturer and by <laughs> how far it grows. Um, but you add it all up, and if you've got 12 gallons, but you're only supplying eight, well, then some of your sprinkler heads are only, you know, throwing the water three inches. So that goes to sprinkler design. But my point is, uh, when you're running a sprinkler under a tree, how long do you have to run it? The easiest thing to do is put out a coffee cup, run it until you have three inches in the cup. And if you've got a big tree, say you've got a, you know, big 40, 50 foot tree, you're probably going to have to do each side of the tree separately. Uh, but, you know, unless you can really have a sprinkler, 
And and if you want real low application rates, the best low application rates, well, sulfur hoses are very low. Um, and then a rainbird or an impact sprinkler are, are very low too. Sometimes as little as a quarter inch per hour. So rainbirds are very uh, uh, popular on slopes where you can't, if you apply water, uh, say a half an inch, an inch or two inches per hour on a slope, it just runs off. And you're gonna, have, you're just, it's just gonna run off and you're wasting your water. Uh, the old pop-up sprinkler heads that are on lawns, the old ones that pop up and just spray, a little fan spray, those often apply water at two inches per hour. That's a very high application rate. Soils only absorb water between a quarter inch and a half an inch an hour. So a clay will absorb water typically at about a quarter inch per hour. A sandy soil will absorb water closer to a half an inch per hour. If you apply water faster than the infiltration rate, it runs off. So it's not unusual on lawn systems with these old sprinkler heads and you turn them on and in three to five minutes, you've got runoff because you're applying it at two inches per hour. A lot of the newer sprinkler heads have these little fingers and they rotate. And if you ever see those, they, they're rotating little streams. Those apply between a quarter inch and a half an inch per hour. We haven't talked about lawns much because this is all about trees, but just to digress momentarily, lawns need more water than any other element in your landscape. They take uh, an inch a week in the spring and the fall and an inch and a half a week in the summer. If you add that up, that's about 36 inches up to 48 inches of water per year to keep a lawn alive in the San Gabriel Valley or any hot interior valley. If you're at the beach, it's three quarters of an inch in the spring and the fall. It's, you know, about an inch in the week, a week in the summer. It get up the desert, it's three inches a week in the summer. That's called your evapotranspiration rate, how much water you lose from the soil, either on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So lawns are typically, and they're shallow rooted, they dry out rapidly. The upper three to six inches of soil dries out rapidly in the heat of summer. So within a day or two, the top three to six inches is gonna be dry. That's why you deep water trees. You get the water down to two feet. That water will be there for two to four weeks available to the tree. Lawns are watered just the opposite of trees. They're watered frequently and shallow. So typically twice a week in the spring and the fall, three times a week in the summer or basically every other day. But every time you water them, you give them about a half an inch. Every time you water a big mature tree, you give it three to four inches of water. So you can see lawns are, well, first off, the biggest use of water in the landscape. Uh, some people think pools, swimming pools use a lot of water. They actually don't. <laughs> they only lose water by evaporation. Lawns lose water because the lawn is sucking it out of the soil. This keep itself, you know, that's how it functions. So, and that, you know, so lawns, I don't know if you've heard of this term, the pan evaporation rate. The pan evaporation rate is how much water you lose from a pan of water on a daily basis. And it, you know, it's different all over the world, of course. And that people collect that data daily all over the world. You can go find that data. And so that's all a pool is losing is evaporation. And of course we have pretty good pan evaporation rates here in Southern California, especially in the hot interior valleys. But other parts of the world have very low pan evaporation rates, like you know, in cooler, wetter regions. So, so Jerry, we have this, some more questions. Colleen Carey, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? She had asked before in the in the chat about asking you to repeat your advice on uh, the fertilizer relevant to nitrogen. And what is your well, what, what question would you like to ask now, Colleen? not even relevant to nitrogen. I couldn't understand what you were advising on fertilizer when you're planting the root ball. Could you repeat that, Ann? I, I couldn't hear it. Did you hear so, it good, Ann? Well, what is your, yes, what is your advice on fertilizer when you're planting the tree? What fertilizer would you add? I know you mentioned compost and mycorrhizae, and neither of those is really a fertilizer like the typical now, nitrogen phosphorus. Well, mycorrhizae now are coming. You can get pure mycorrhizae knocking, but you can, but most, a lot of the mycorrhizae on the market is a mixture of mycorrhizae with fertilizer. And the most obvious example of that is Dr. Earth. But there's many. I'm not endorsing Dr. Earth over anybody else. In fact, it's a little more expensive than anybody else. Um, and so when you're fertilizing trees, you want to use a low nitrogen fertilizer. You don't, 
And there's three numbers on a fertilizer bag. And it represents nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK. And it'll say like 10, 10, 10, or it'll say 30, 10, 10. Typically, lawn fertilizers will be very high in nitrogen, 20%, up to 30% nitrogen. Lawns use a lot of nitrogen. You, you fertilize them, they grow like crazy. You mow them, you fertilize them some more. Trees, you want just a steady growth rate. You don't want to push them with a whole bunch of nitrogen. And I've got an interesting story I'll tell you here in a second to demonstrate this. So typically, you're going to want to use a fertilizer that might be about 4% nitrogen, maybe up to 8. Cottonseed meal is wonderful. Cottonseed meal is about 7 or 8% nitrogen. Here's another important part about nitrogen. There's two forms of nitrogen in a broad sense. There's soluble nitrogen and insoluble nitrogen. So the soluble nitrogens are your standard kind of conventional fertilizer. Sodium, uh, not sodium, ammonium nitrate, which you can't buy anymore because it blows up, but uh, uh, calcium nitrate, um, uh, ammonium nitrate, calcium nitrate, uh, ammonium sulfate, sulfate um, urea, these are all soluble. So if you take a soluble fertilizer, nitrogen, a soluble nitrogen fertilizer and put it on your tree, it's all available all at once. And, and the nitrogen level in the soil spikes, and then after a few weeks, it crashes. If you use a non-soluble nitrogen source, which are typically things like cottonseed meal, uh, well, blood meal, which is a little hot, it's about 15% nitrogen, be careful with blood meal. Uh, all the meals, cottonseed meal, blood meal, feather meal, uh, what's the other one uh, they use from, uh, you know, they use, you know, you put algae, you know, the brown algae, will be used in these and then typically they get organic registration because the nitrogen source is natural those the nitrogen has to be decomposed to be released into the soil and it takes about eight weeks and so what happens when you add something like cottonseed meal to the soil is the nitrogen level goes up a little bit it stays real steady for about eight weeks and then it slowly comes down <clears throat> that's a better way to fertilize plants. But when you fertilize a, a new tree, just use a little bit of a low nitrogen fertilizer. Just, you don't want to pump it up a whole bunch of nitrogen. And now my story. At Cal Poly Pomona, the students uh, in the Hort department were allowed and encouraged really to buy all these uh, uh, plug trays and move up these little plants like pansies and petunias. They're usually annual color into four inch pots, grow them all up, and then they would go out and sell them to nurseries and they could split the profit. They would get the money in advance from the foundation, buy all the potting soil, buy all the pots, order the, the, the plug trays. But then they would take all those four inch pots and they put them under a, um, a Caricia speciosa, the uh, Brazilian thorn tree or Capoc tree. You know, it has the thorns all up and down the trunk and the big pink flowers, they're real pretty trees, they get real big. So they put these, uh, all these four inch pots underneath this tree and they fertilize them every two weeks for years. And that tree grew like a weed <laughs> and boom, it's like 50 feet tall. But when you fertilize it like that and get all that rapid growth, the wood is very weak. It's growing too fast. And so these big scaffolds that were about 10 inches started ripping off the tree from 30 to 40 feet in the air and crashing down underneath the tree. And it only took a few days after a couple of those branches came down that the whole tree had to be removed because it, you know, that's just way too much fertilizer for that tree or for any tree. So light fertilizations are the way to go with trees. Add just a little bit into the soil to mix it in just to stimulate a little bit of new growth. Uh, stay away from anything that's really high. If you use cottonseed meal, that's great. Uh, you can use blood meal, but be careful. Uh, my second story is somebody had planted a whole row of oleanders and came into the arboretum because they had all, all the, they were all burned. All the edges of the leaves were brown and the plants were, were doing terrible. So she was asking what was wrong and I said, well, did you fertilize? And she said, yeah. I said, how much? She said she put a cup of blood meal on each plant. 
That's a lot. <laughs> and she, she burned them with blood meal. So my caution is blood meal is about 15% nitrogen. She should have used a couple of tablespoons and she used a whole cup and she burned her plants. So now there's another thing you can do if, if you know, these uh, cottonseed meal and, and bone meal and blood meal, all the meals, they're a little more expensive source of nitrogen, not a lot. But if you want to use a cheaper one, often what I use is just a generic 16, 16, 16 on my fruit trees. You can take that fertilizer and apply it at half strength twice as often, and you get the same effect as using cottonseed meal. You just to get a sl slight rise in nitrogen availability in the soil, and it'll stay steady, steady for, the, for the growing season. Having big peaks in nitrogen crashing, a peak in nitrogen crashing, that's not the best way to fertilize trees. Okay, Jerry, we have another question from Thomas Stahl. I sometimes see plastic pipes sticking out of the ground close to a tree trunk. So during high heat or drought, water can be applied directly to the root ball. Is that yeah, a good idea? I see that all the time too. And I think it's a harebrained idea that has no practical benefit. Uh, landscape architects love to put that detail in their plans. The best for me, my opinion, is the best way to water trees is to apply it slowly to the surface of the soil and let it slowly percolate and infiltrate into the soil to a depth of two feet. I don't see any benefit to, to that. It's oft, I see it often on public works projects. So when they're planting street trees or they're planting uh, landscape around new government buildings, you know, I see it. And I've always questioned that. I don't think it has any practical benefit because so it, you know, now you're getting water down to the bottom of this hole. And remember, here's another thing that's important to remember. 80% of your roots are in the top two feet. They're not down three feet. Where's all the oxygen? Where's all the water? Where's all the nutrients? They're in the top 12, you know, to 24 inches. You get down to three feet and you've got limited oxygen availability, limited organic matter, and, and, and what kind, there are different kinds of roots. You have big, large, what we call anchor roots. You know, the tap root is the first root from the seedling. So in a way you shouldn't use tap root to describe these roots, but roots that will go down three, four, five feet. And they're large roots. They're holding the tree up, but the fine feeder roots are in the top 12 to 24 inches. Those are the roots that absorb water and nutrients that absorb the mineral nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, the micronutrients. <clears throat> so I think you're better off watering the surface of the soil slowly or with the basin and, and soaking it with the deep soak. So I don't recommend installing that type of uh, irrigation uh, uh, or those, you know, those pipes down deep. It's just, it's unnecessary. And I don't think it really, I don't think it's detrimental. I just think it's kind of a waste of your time and energy. So Jerry, we have another question. Do you have any tips for planting a deodorant? Many of our viewers are people who received a tree last Saturday or, or are going to pick up a tree um, uh, this afternoon. So one of the trees we gave out was a deodar. Okay, do you have any tips? Well, there's nothing special about a deodar. You would plant it just the same as you'd plant any other tree. Um, now, the question is, do you want to retain the lower branches or do you want the trunk to be free of branches up to about eight to 10 feet, 12 feet? Um, I think most of the, the lots that people will be planting these, you know, maybe somebody has an acre. You know, there are some big lots in El Camino, obviously. Uh, if you've got the space, you can leave those lower branches and, and then you have, you know, these sweeping lower branches that go out, you know, from, and they're beautiful, they're gorgeous. But if you don't have the space and you want to be able to walk under your tree, you need to remove, it's the same thing we've been talking about. You're going to tip those branches, come back in a year, year and a half or so, and remove them entirely. But other than, um, no, there's nothing special about a DNR. Dig the hole, the, the depth of the root ball, or maybe a little less so that root ball sticks up about a half an inch. Uh, and these are the right sizes, fives and 15. You know, I, here's my next story. I love telling stories. <laughs> So I, 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 Public Works had asked me to come up and meet with the homeowners on Deodar Lane, which is not the name of the street, but everyone knows what I'm talking about, or Christmas Tree Lane, where they, they decorate all those Deodars for nearly a mile. And everyone comes in December and it's spectacular. 
those are big old trees. Some of those trees probably 75 to 100 years old. Uh, a lot of them have oak root rot fungus in hollow trunks, the big ones, the really old ones. So the public works at the county road, as you know, <coughs> they wanted to cut down a couple of them because they thought they were dangerous. The homeowners were resistant because they don't like to see those big old trees removed. So I met with some homeowners and, and public works people and we walked around and they told me their story. They used to you know, have to remove a tree or a tree would blow over in the wind and they'd come in and replant with a 48 inch box tree. That's four feet box tree. To do that, you need to dig the hole with a backhoe. You have to lower the, the tree in with a crane. It's a big project. It, it takes you know half a day or a whole day and it's fairly expensive. And they noticed whenever they did that, that those trees just kind of sat there and they didn't grow very fast and they didn't even establish very fast. The roots tended to stay in that big root ball. They didn't tend to grow out into the natural soil very well. So they went to what we call sleeves. Sleeves are about two and a half feet tall and about four inches at the top. And they're tall. And then the, the plant itself is only two or three feet. You know, the tree itself is two to three feet tall. With that, you dig the hole with a shovel. You drop it in. You don't need a, a crane. You don't need a backhoe. Uh, you drop it in. And when they went to those, they found that those trees planted from sleeves caught up and passed the 48s within about three to five years. So if you go up there and you see a lot of the new trees on Diodar, like what's the name of the actual tree? I was just on it yesterday. Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa. So I was up on Santa Rosa the other day, and I've been up there multiple times to try and help people with those trees because they have a homeowners association up there to protect the trees and take care of the trees. And there's some young trees that have been in the ground now about 10 years and they are taken off and looking fabulous. And they were planted from these little sleeves. The smaller the tree you plant, the better tree you get. So the fives and 15s are really good sizes. Uh, and then the other issue for those deodars up there was the drought. We went through that five year drought and a lot of those trees received no supplemental irrigation. So after five years of getting almost no rain, they, a lot of them were in severe decline. They were doing very poorly. So I said, okay, this is what you do to try and bring these trees back. Start soaking them good once a month and then treat them with a fertilizer mycorrhizae mixture. And uh, the association asked the county, our, the ag commissioner, if we could do that work for them. Where our, our department had never done it before. They didn't feel confident. So they said, no, we can't do that for you. I don't know if they ever did the treatment itself, but I've recommended this treat to many people. You have a tree in decline, you drill the soil with holes, you put in the material, you water it good, you put down three to four inches of compost under the whole canopy of the tree, you keep watering once a month, maybe, and then hopefully next spring you see a real strong growth promotion and your street, the tree starts growing new growth, it recovers, it looks good. I've seen it work on oaks. I've seen it work on some deodars too. And on redwoods, you know, some of our trees, we, I've seen a lot of decline due to the drought, particularly the drought. So even though these are drought tolerant trees, like our native oaks and our, the deodars are drought tolerant, uh, that doesn't mean they can go years without water. Monthly irrigation is all they need and they can go through the drought fine. Um, the other one, uh, the other thing is, you know, during that drought up in Santa Clarita in their natural parks where they have no irrigation and it was mostly oak woodland, they had a 50% oak mortality rate up there. Those trees went through five years of drought. By the third and fourth year, they were being hit with various, uh, you know, wood bores because of their drought stress. Now they're susceptible to the wood bores. How do you protect pines and oaks and other trees from wood boring insects? You keep them watered well. That keeps the wood bores out. If they're drought stressed and they're going into decline, the wood bores will go right after them. And then once you get those in there, there's you're pretty much probably gonna lose the tree. So, and I did go up to Santa Clarita to look a lot of those trees. When you pull the, you know, the trees are dead, you pull the bark off and underneath that bark, you can see all the tunneling from the various uh, species of wood boring insects. Like uh, now I've forgotten some of the names, but. It doesn't really name matter what which one it is. The whole point is to keep your trees well hydrated. So there on Santa Rosa, 
in that center median, they had to figure out a way to get out there and start watering those trees on the, on the street side, the street, you know, not in the center median. You know, it's just a dirt, so, there's no sidewalk, it's just dirt, right? Well, those, the people who live right adjacent to that tree that's in front of their home, they need to get out once a month and figure out how to water that tree. And, and that's how you save those trees. Thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, we're giving away 40 trees and um, I'm wondering what we can tell the new um, owners of these trees, the new guardians and caregivers of these trees, what to expect in the first year after planning. Is a tree putting its energy into just making roots or when, it, when are we gonna see growth of the canopy and how fast is that gonna be? Well, it's not unusual for trees not to grow a whole lot in the first year to, to two years because the tree will be trying to grow mostly roots. Um, if we have a good wet winter and you get a lot of rain, uh, hopefully you'll see you know a lot of shoot growth next spring. Some trees are really slow to start throwing new shoots. Uh, the, uh, the pink trumpet tree, which is, uh, now I've forgotten the genus, uh, not coletarian. Tababuya? Tababuya, Tababuya and Petagnosa. Um, that tree tends to sit for maybe two or three years before you see much new growth. And don't expect flowers from the pink trumpet tree until about four or five years. So they got to get established, start growing a lot of new foliage, and then finally they start blooming. Uh, the, the golden uh, uh, trumpet tree, the pink trumpet tree, the Arboretum has an apricot. It's a hybrid between the two. If you go to their plant sale, maybe you get lucky enough to get one. <coughs> but yeah, uh, it can take a year or two before you see a lot of growth promotion. If you put a little nitrogen in that hole, you probably will see a lot of new growth the next spring. Hey, Jerry, I, um, I want to show, I want to share a picture of um, one of the trees we're giving away. And that is this uh, Arbutus. This is... Um, these are in five gallon pots. They're on the small side, but they're very, very healthy. Can you all see that, the arbutus in these pots? Are you all That's seeing that? Early. Yes. Yes. So now they have, um, they don't have a, like a, most of them have a leader, but they also have side branches. So they could be grown as multi stem trees or trained into a standard tree. So if somebody wanted to train this into a standard tree, one trunk, how quickly should they be trimming off the side branches? Well, what I would do, if you want a standard, then you're just going to uh, uh, nip the ends of these side branches to dwarf them. And you're going to let that central leader take off. But say you had a, a, a bare wall and you wanted to cover it up and screen it. So you want a multi-trunk tree. So when you go to a nursery, they often list trees as either standards or multi indicating multi-trunk. Most uh, kind of arborists kind of see multi-trunks as being a structural default, but these aren't that big a tree to begin with, you know, 25 feet, maybe 30. <coughs> so, you know, what's your goal? What you want this tree to do in your garden? If you want this to be a standard uh, and be able to walk underneath it or have maybe some shrubs underneath it, then you're going to want to just nip the ends of these branches, these lower branches right here and right there. Yeah, these lower ones. Okay, and this is this one. Yeah, so that one that you just showed is is now almost competing to be a, a co-dominant leader coming from the very base. So yeah, you just take off an inch or two, about an inch off the tip. And, and when you take off all the tips of the side branches, that one you don't tip will grow very fast. It'll become the dominant leader or the central leader. And, and Really, uh, you don't have any of your scaffold branches developed on this on any of these for several years. So you're going to train these trees with, you know, uh, periodically once, you know, after six months, after a year, and keep training it to grow the way in the form you want it. You could even espalier them if you wanted. You could have these side branches grow on a trellis. You can do, I mean, you think of plants as a little bit like they're they have this plastic nature. You can force them to grow any way you want. Think of bonsai, think of espalier, think of, you know, uh, of the various ways you can control the growth of plants. But the way you do that is frequent, uh, frequent pruning 
every six months, year or so, two years, and, and just a little bit of pruning, not waiting until the tree gets you know, to a certain size and come back and then change how it grew. So, so yeah, these are nice looking plants. They look really healthy. Yeah, they, they looked great when I saw them. And um, Jerry, somebody, you mentioned espalier and somebody in the chat asked about uh, growing fruit trees in an espalier fashion. So how do you plant those? I guess the well, question- If you had a fruit tree and you wanted to grow an espalier, you would orient any side branches parallel to your trellis or wall that you're gonna grow it on. And then you're gonna tie those branches off to your trellis and then any that are coming straight out at you or going straight into the trellis, you're gonna, you're gonna prune off. Now be careful, espalier, uh, one problem I've seen with espalier is sometimes you can get some sunburn on the trunk. So uh, you gotta guard against that. But just orient those side branches, let them take off, and, and then anything growing outside of that plane, you're gonna prune off. So can you suggest some fruit other than apples and pears that can be espaliered? Well, literally, you could espalier anything. You know, grapes are grown espalier. Uh, apples and pears are the most common. And in fact, even in commercial production, you'll see uh, apples grown espalier. Um, not always, it's, it's one technique of growing. Um, but yeah, you could espalier anything, really. I've seen, uh, you know, uh, uh, pyrocantha, you know, grown espalier on a wall. And then when it gets all the red berries, you've got this whole wall covered with really pretty really nice effect. Uh, and I've seen a lot of uh, pears and apples grown that way. I rarely see citrus grown that way, but yeah, you can do it that way, sure. Okay, great. And so in espalier, I guess there's a lot more pruning than you would do other, with a regular tree. Well, because generally for any fruit tree, short. there's more pruning. Okay. Um, and yeah, you're forcing the tree to grow in one plane. So yes. you're gonna have to frequently remove any branches that are growing outside of that plane. Okay. But then make sure you protect that trunk from full sun. Okay. And typically you're going to want to orient that espalier so that the plane of growth is north to south. So the sun comes up and hits it in the east and then goes down in the west and hits it on the west. Otherwise, okay. well, it's been, if you're up against a wall, a south-facing wall, that's, that would not be the case. Okay. Okay, I think we've gotten to all of our questions. So I want to thank you very much, Jerry. And I want to thank all of you who have attended. And those of you who have received a tree or, or will receive a tree, please, please send us a photo of your newly planted tree. We really appreciate that. And we're thrilled whenever we get a photo from one of you. So please do that. And, uh, and, and for um, those of you who would like to go over some of this information, we will be posting the recording of this on the Altadena Heritage website. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jerry, very much for another wonderful presentation. And now we, uh, we have a good idea of how to plant our trees really well. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me.